Dear friends, colleagues, and guests, welcome this intergroup of the welfare and conservation of uh, animals event on the responsible care of cats and dogs. Today we will present a new policy guide, uh, guidance document that aims to support EU member states in developing companion animal population management policy. Very important one. People care deeply about dogs and cats. In many urban as well as rural areas in Europe, large numbers of cats and dogs roam freely up to now. Their health and welfare can be seriously affected directly when the stray animals themselves live under poor conditions and indirectly when inhuman and ineffective population control measures are used. In the European Union, the majority of stray dogs are abandoned by their owner or born from unsterilized owned dogs that are free to roam. Certain groups of stray cats are also referred to as feral, meaning unsocialized. They have not had any contact with humans and are very often incorrectly seen as a wild cat. Instead, they are offspring of cats from private households. Managing dog and cat populations can help reduce animal welfare problems and public health risks with associated economic burdens. But years of ineffective or inhuman straight control can leave the public outraged and governments frustrated by the lack of progress. At EU level, there is no legal basis for dealing with stray purely on the basis of animal welfare. Decisions about legislation and enforcement measures fall under the competence of the member states. In most countries, the issue is handled by at municipality level, as illustrated in the three case studies supporting the guidance document. At present, different programs and guidelines to manage control stray population exist. The World Organization for Animal Health coordinates programs in different European regions according to their guidelines, and the International Companion Management Coalition has also developed tools. Other schemes, such as those run by NGOs, also exist. The document that we present today aims to provide a very specific EU guidance based on such guidelines and best practices. With regards to logistics, the participants following the event online can submit questions on the online tool by clicking on the questions. I mean questions, uh, you will see this uh, special tool tab at the top right hand corner. In person participants, of course, will be able to submit questions during the expert panel session. For those participants attending the meeting online, you can access the question under the pool tab at the top right hand corner while in person. And participants can log in using the QR code that you have uh, been given once you entered the room. Dear colleagues, it is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Ms. Alexandra Hamont Seaman, International Advocacy and Policy Advisor and Chair of the Cats and Dogs Working Group of European Eurogroup for uh, Animals who will present the guidance document uh, focusing on the dogs, uh, uh, does and does not of uh, population management practices, I believe. I mean, it was must be dogs and cats, but uh, anyway, I mean, print uh, error. Dear Alexander, you have uh, 15 minutes to present uh, your uh, information. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the introduction. Can you can you hear me all right? Yeah, 
Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Intergroup on the Welfare and Conservation of Animals for championing this initiative, and also to Eurogroup for Animals for organizing this important event. I apologize for not being able to be with you in person as planned. I was due to be on a Eurogroup or Eurostar train this morning, but I have come down with a nasty cold, which I didn't want to share with you or other Eurostar passengers. So <laughs> it would have been great to be there in person, but it is just one of those things. Uh, first slide, please. The next one. <laughs> okay. So today, as we launch, um, as we launch uh, the first dog and cat population management policy guidance document, I would just like to say a few words about the context and how this document came about. Uh, most of us in this room have taken an active interest in the situation regarding dog ownership trends and how dog population, well, dog and cat population management is implemented in Europe. Uh, the treatment of stray dogs has raised many has been raised many times in the EU Parliament, and for many NGOs working in member states and on the ground, dog and cat population control is really their core work. We know that European citizens would like to see greater protection afforded to companion animals and how companion animal populations are managed. Currently, there is not only a wide variation of approaches across the European Union. But in my opinion, there is also a lack of common understanding about what a companion um, population management is. Next slide, please. Uh, we see the recently introduced EU animal health law and the adoption of the World Animal Health Organization, formerly known as OIE Code Chapter 7.7, as providing foundations and motivation for improved population management across the EU. In this, um, in this guidance document, the document we are presenting today, we explain why stray control that focuses only on the system symptoms fails and why there is a great need to develop a permanent system of services that can address the needs and challenges of effective dog and cat population management. Next slide, please. Um, I would now also like to uh, refer to ICOM guidance document, in particular the updated uh, dog population management guidance. Uh, I have been involved in ICOM from the early beginnings, and um, in 2019 we've developed a number, uh, number of guidance documents. ICOM has really been set up to support the development and use of humane and effective companion animal population management worldwide. The coalition was formed in 2006 uh, as a forum for a discussion on global dog and cat management issues um, and um, really was formed to support the development and use of humane and effective um, management worldwide to share experiences, ideas and data on companion animal population dynamics. Um, the um, I'm, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with some of the documents, but you know I, I refer you to the ICAM website where you can find and download both the uh, dog population and the cat population management guidance, as well as the document "Are We Making a Difference," uh, which is a guide to monitoring and evaluating population management programs. The, the just just a, a really in. in summary of what, what you see in front of you on the slide. The population management is built on six principles, which are detailed in the ICOM guidance document. Um, they're all relevant, but in this European guidance, two of those principles are explained in more detail, and um, I will talk about them in, a, in, in more detail in a minute. Next slide, please. So firstly, the concept of focusing on root causes. We compare and explain the difference between classic stray control and population management in this guidance document. Traditional stray dog control has a very narrow perception. Uh, the common mistake is to focus only on the current roaming dog or cat population, leading to symptom-only control, considering all roaming dogs to be unknown, which we know is not the case, and the sole focus and be the sole focus of the control efforts. This might involve culling on the streets, catch and kill, or catch and reunite or rehome. When we broaden our perspective and we consider not only current roaming dogs, but also the subpopulations that make up 
the whole dog population, then we see a very different picture. Some of these processes are important sources to future roaming dogs, uh, such as free roaming and abandonment of own dogs, uh, often driven by unwanted breeding and irresponsible ownership. So effective management works to address the source of future roaming dogs, um, future roaming animals, dogs and cats, with a focus on the root causes. Next slide, please. In this guidance, we also introduced the concept of population management as a system underpinned by foundations that provide a political and social will for population management, and then the services which provide the direct intervention. Um, the, this system must be appreciated as permanent because um, population management is not a one-off project and as long as people own animals there will be need for a permanent system that can address any unwanted consequences of animal ownership um, and although there might be short-term projects to promote one or more services the system must persist for the long term striving to build a positive relationship between owners and carers and their animals promoting responsible behavior of these people to maintain good welfare and mitigate the risks animals might present to other animals, the environment and people. Uh, the system must also adapt to changes in the way people engage with their animals, including acquisition of dogs and cats, which has changed hugely in Europe over the past decade or more, in particular with cross-border movement of animals. Next slide, please. Whilst recognizing the earlier principle of working to address the source of future unwanted and roaming animals as core to the population management, we also need to tackle the current populations, the current roaming dogs and cats. And this guide reflects on two relevant services. One is adoption using shelters or a homing centers and the use of new and return to manage roaming um, animals in site, in situ. Uh, important consideration of each option are presented. These considerations are influenced by the local context and also the characteristics of individual animal. Uh, hence, these services need to be used when appropriate and should be considered as options that can be used in combination. Next slide, please. Um, this guide also presents a conceptual journey through four stages from stray control through effective population management. I know this is not very yet clearly visible here, but there is a, um, this, this you will be able to see in the guidance document uh, and, and the detail. I can just, I don't know if I think we have time. I'm, I'm just gonna um, run through the four stages. Um, so the stage one we see as the symptom only stray control. So, um, there is minimal legislation or enforcement of ownership practices in place and no coordinated system of management. So we'd like to see the member states and, and interventions move to, to stage two, where we see the population management beginning. Implementation is still patchy. Uh, there is no killing of animals as a method of, of population control uh, and any cruel practices are prohibited but still the, the interventions and, and approach is patchy. Um, there are pilot projects developing localized projects to address the, the needs and challenges, but we'd like to see the interventions going further and beyond and developing to a, to a developing or yeah, growing towards a population management with the permanent systems, which are implemented across all areas and with equal focus on sources of animals and on the symptom which is dealing with the current animal populations. And then finally, we'd like to see all member states reaching a, which um, I think is to totally um, and perfectly possible, reaching the stage four where population management, management is integral to regulations and social norms and focuses nearly al always on sources with the minimal efforts on current roaming animals. So, so this is kind of a stepwise movement through, through the population management stages um, that um, we try to uh, illustrate in, in the guidance document. Uh, next slide, please.
Um, the guide also recognizes that although local government is often leading in enforcement of regulations and implementation of many population management services, the national governments also have a very important role to play, providing governance, um, funding and training of local government authorities, and also helping progress those important owner behaviors through a combination of education, public campaigning and development of suitable legislation that is both effective for managing populations and enforceable across the territory, recognizing that the right services to use for the current roaming dogs and cats may vary with the local community and with the individual animal. Next slide, please. The guidance is accompanied by three excellent case studies, which put all the learning into practice. One will be presented in detail by the colleague just after me. And then there are two case studies, which I will just briefly talk about. Uh, one run by Deutsche Teachersbund in Odessa and the other by Anima Sterua in Portugal. Uh, they, both colleagues are here in attendance and I'm sure they would be more than happy to answer any questions or give you more detail <coughs> Excuse me. About, the, uh, about the projects. <clears throat> there is not much time to present the case studies in, in great detail, but they both demonstrate the impact of evidence-based interventions with good monitoring and evaluation in place to track progress and impact. Odessa project saw a huge reduction in numbers of free roaming animals with targeted CNVR, community engagement and education. Ila de Faro project, which was led by Anima Derua and other collaborating organizations, Similarly, demonstrates how impactful the tools we have available for DPM can be when used to develop evidence-based designs by population assessment and the projects which invest time and resources to properly identify and understand their problems before they embarked on interventions so that they use that knowledge and that data and that understanding to design sustainable and effective interventions. Both projects invest in their monitoring and evaluation so that they can continually learn what works and are able to develop an adaptive management that can respond to changes in population dynamics and any other factors that might, might change. Really, both of these examples, including the third example, which will be presented uh, here, demonstrate the impact of evidence-based approach to dog and cat population management and also the importance of monitoring and evaluation for long-term sustainability and learning. So I think, I hope I, I haven't gone too, too much over my time and I thank you for your attention. Um, next slide, please, the final slide. Um, thank you for your attention and yeah, I look forward to any questions you might have and to hearing from the next presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander, for your presentation. Indeed, it's a very impressive um, um, info you just uh, uh, made available to us, as well as those case studies. Uh, I just want to highlight uh, some numbers, incredible numbers. I mean, the project in Odessa started in uh, 2004, and at the, on the streets of Odessa have been around from 70 to 80,000 stray dogs, right? And by uh, 2021, uh, mm, I understood, the number was re reduced uh, to three or four thousand, 20 times, 20 times. I mean, uh, it's, it's incredible. Um, those uh, projects are indeed uh, very important and uh, uh, practice-based. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm looking forward for our further exchange. We will hear now about uh, a case from uh, Bulgaria, where the municipality of Sofia, that's a capital city of uh, Bulgaria, adopted uh, again a successful approach, which consisted of the mass sterilization and rabies vaccination of the stray dog population and contributed to, to significantly reduce the number of stray dogs in this city. This is one of the three case studies illustrated in the guidance document, along with Odessa and Ilha de, uh, de Faro, as mentioned by uh, Alexander before. 
Ms. Petya Georgieva, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from Trakia University of Stara Zagora, will present uh, this important work. Dear Petya, uh, floor is yours and you have around 15 minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Petya Georgieva, a veterinarian at Ekurov University, the Municipal Department of Sofia. Uh, just the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Um, the Municipal Department of Sofia, tasked with managing the stray dog population, I am presenting our activities over the last 15 years, a best practice example showing that the management of strays can be achieved in a humane way that is also effective, impactful and sustainable. I will be co-presenting with our NGO partner, Four Paws, an international animal welfare organization with a local stray animal care team in Sofia. During my presentation, I will talk... Next slide, please. During my presentation, I will talk to you about the situation with stray animals in Bulgaria before 2008, the Bulgarian Animal Protection Act, and then go into the details of our new strategic approach to manage stray dogs started in 2008 that incorporates many different tools. Next slide, please. Before 2008, the treatment and management of stray animals in Bulgaria was not regulated by legislation. Municipalities and private persons could choose to kill stray animals if they deemed them being a danger to people or even just a nuisance. Many people in Bulgaria were abandoning their unwanted dogs and even more importantly, they weren't controlling the reproduction of their pets leading to many, many unwanted animals being born. The results were a large stray dog population that caused issues like dog bites, a lot of noise and pollution in public spaces, and at the same time also caused a huge amount of suffering to the dogs. People regularly poisoned or shot the dogs, so did municipalities all over Bulgaria. From 1990, yeah, next slide. No, uh, the, previous. the previous. From 1998 to 2006, the practice called catch keep for 14 days and kill is nothing but abhorrent. The most common reaction of the city officials was the launch of kill programs, which involves catching as many strays as possible. These animals were put down, often using barbaric methods. Only for eight years, just in Sofia, are killed 70,000 dogs. Notice, it's only in the capital. That Texas massacre cost the taxpayer 2.5 million euros and caused immense suffering and death. It's a hard pill to swallow because there are no results. Programs like this one are used not only in Bulgaria, but in other places in the world, and they have never yielded the desired effect of controlling the population increase. And there were no veterinary staff prepared to work with stray animals. Next slide, please. A new era has started. The killing of dog, dogs is stopped with the law. In 2008, the first Bulgarian Animal Protection Act entered into force. In Chapter 5, the, are specified the measures of, for controlling the strays. Population based on the method trap, catch, neuter, return accompanied by tight control over domestic dogs, were identified as the only effective approach for a lasting solution of the problem. Today, the law not only encourages neutering of pets, but also requires registration of dogs, thus aims to eradicate the root cause of the problem, the abandonment of unwanted and 
unidentified pets. Next slide, please. After unsuccessful attempts to permanently reduce the number of stray dogs, over the last century, in 2006, Sofia municipality decided to apply a new approach for Bulgaria, which consisted of mass sterilization and rabies vaccination of stray dogs. Um, of Novesie had to cope the tough task working side by side with four pals. What the new legal situation calls for is the action, is the catching of animals on the street, bringing them to shelters or neutering centers, caring them, caring for them professionally. That includes neutering, vaccinating, deworming, tagging them with air tag and a microchip and then releasing them where they were caught. After that, the vets register the microchip in the database so they can track what is happening to them over the years. Launching a campaign for free neutering of pets of owners from risk groups is a really important step in the mastering the population increase. Other main problem are the unwanted litters, which can be prevented with the ongoing castration campaign. Next slide, please. You can see the table on the slide, which is very indicative. There are nearly 30,000 dogs which have been neutered for the past eight years. The amount of sterilized dogs is decreasing, so we can say we're on the right path. Next slide, please. Along with the catch, neuter and return approach, there are other activities that have been implemented all aiming to reduce the numbers of dogs in the streets and in shelters. Opening of new places in shelters, at the end of 2012, a large municipal shelter was opened in the village of Gorny Bugrov with a capacity of 840 animals. And a year later, an extension to that shelter was opened for another 684 dogs. In general, it is remarkable to notice that there are no more pets without breed being adopted, uh, which facts indicates a more responsible attitude of the residents of the capital to this issue. Unfortunately, it is difficult to calculate the exact number of adopted dogs over the years, as there are animals adopted right from the streets or from the shelters, as well as dogs adopted abroad. Next slide, please. So far, so good. We decreased the population of strays, but that was the easy part. Our goal is to increase the number of adopted dogs from municipal and private shelters. Ecuador Novesie and Four Pals are making a great effort in popularizing adoption of non-breeded or stray animals. We are working in promoting the adoption using social networks like Facebook, Instagram, and adoption events in public spaces like parks or special promotions of adoptable dogs in the forecast weather. According to the data of municipal enterprise Ecuador-Bessie, the last few years, the enterprise managed to find a home and a loving people for nearly 3,000 dogs. The slogan of our campaign is adopt, don't shop. It's really not that hard. Go to the shelter, Choose your tail friend, fill up one paper, and you have a new best friend. Plus, it doesn't cost a penny. Next slide, please. For this slide, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Margarita Chankova from Four Pals to briefly present this activity. Yeah.
Hi, I'm Margarita Chanko, veterinarian from uh, Forpost, Bulgaria. As a partner organization of the city, we support the, this project with uh, sterilization, with treatment for sick and injured animals, responsible pet uh, owner education, adoption promotion, but also another unique project, which is training former stray dogs to become a therapy dogs. The aim of this is to improve the attitude towards the dogs on the street and to decrease the cruelty towards them. We want to show that the strays can be a value members of our society. The name of this project is Animal Assisted Interventions and the aim is former stray dogs become therapy dogs as ambassadors for the other strays. We are working on that project since 2017. The stray dogs are carefully selected from the patient of the veterinary clinic in Sofia. And uh, generally they are good natures, which makes them well suited for animal assisted interventions. All the dogs go through socialization, special training and monitoring. Until the moment they show their, that their abilities are as equal as to other animals that are grown up at home. So I'll give back the stage to Petya Moskin. So that's our last slide. And uh, now, the last but not, le not the least, as important. Uh, now, the most important part of this presentation, the results for the last 15 years. Over the period of the project from 2008 up to now, a significant reduction of the stray dogs in the municipality of Sofia has been documented. The project's impact has delivered a reduction from um, estimated 11,000 dogs in 2007 to less than 3,500 in 2018, and a further significant reduction estimated up to 2022. Furthermore, the characteristic of the stray dog population changed mainly from mainly unsterilized young animals to an estimated sterilization rate of over 70%, with the dog population also aging over time and a very few new stray dogs observed in recent years. In addition, a marked improvement of the welfare status of the remaining dogs was recorded, with most of dogs having dedicated caregivers providing them with shelter, water, water food and veterinary care if required. We hope that this encouraging statistic show that humane stray dog management can be impactful, effective and sustainable. Thank you for the attention. Any questions? Eight time you have changed the uh, tendency and uh, you achieved it is very impressive uh, sterilization rates as well as uh, you know le a few um, uh, uh, stray dogs uh, on the streets of uh, um, Sofia. May I ask you one question immediately? Uh, what was your um, contact with the schools or education institutions in uh, in Sofia? Did you approach uh, schools include um, some subject on uh, animal welfare into curriculum of uh, Bulgarian? Uh, school children? Did you reach it? I mean, did you ask the Ministry of Education of Bulgaria to do it? I can't uh, answer that question right now. It's not uh, part of my uh, my work. Okay. So maybe later we will get <coughs> this reply, but uh, in any mm -hmm. case, thank you very much for your presentation and please Stay with us uh, for uh, this panel discussion. Maybe you will receive more questions from uh, people around here and online as well. So um, now we go to the expert uh, panel and welcome back. We will uh, now proceed uh, uh, to the panel with two 
very experienced experts. I will first introduce Ms. Anne Creel, who is a Doctor of Veterinary Science and Honorary Secretary of uh, FECAVA. <laughs> Fekawa, indeed. And the second expert is uh, uh, Mr. Paolo Dalla Villa, uh, who is a technical officer in disaster management and animal welfare at uh, WOAH, previously OIE, sub uh, regional representation in Brussels. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, you came and joined us uh, for this uh, uh, panel. Um, um, can you, I mean, both of you uh, make some observations uh, on your experience on uh, uh, population management? Uh, what are the lessons, tendencies, uh, uh, maybe certain uh, bottlenecks uh, in, in, in this um, process? Uh, I know that uh, sometimes we approach up, sometimes downs, but nevertheless, I mean, I would appreciate uh, if each of you would make some uh, observation up to five or seven minutes, and then we can go on Q&A session. Maybe yeah. let me start from you. Yeah. Yep, can everybody understand me? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm a veterinary surgeon and I'm uh, working in the field every day. I have a dog clinic and a cat only clinic. So I'm, um, we see the other side of the, the dog population, the ones who are very, um, yeah, well homed and uh, spoiled uh, as well. So, um, and I'm here to represent FE and FECAVA. Uh, we as an org a European organizations see both sides as well because we are lucky to live in the side mm -hmm. of Europe where we don't see that much stray dogs, uh, but we are aware of the fact that there are uh, a lot of stray dogs. Um, and as veterinarians, we of course uh, want to see every dog and cat having a nice home and an owner, uh, but it has to be a responsible owner. And that is something that um, organizations like uh, European Commission uh, can really work on uh, because they must have give us resources to go to social media, uh, television, I don't know where, uh, shelters, uh, just that people are aware that if you take a dog into your family, that it's for a lifetime of the dog, not for your lifetime. So you will have the uh, honor to have more than one pet as well. So that's also something that we can, uh, yeah, force on. So a pet is not for your lifetime, it's for their lifetime, and you have to take care of it from day one until he dies. Um, and on the other hand, what we see now, sure in the pandemic, is that people don't find uh, family pets because on the floor or on in the field, the demand of pup for puppies, for example, is much bigger than the breeders that provide our puppies. So that's why illegal trade is still a, a big, big problem. And uh, surely during the pandemic, we saw prices for puppies go really high in the sky, 2,000, 2,800 euros for a mongrel. A mongrel that, will, that means, or is called now kind of designer dog, who is not a breed, it's a, a mix of everything. Um, or people go to shelters to try to get a family pet. And if they don't get one in the national shelters, it's a little bit a problem in Belgium. <laughs> You have to fill in a really um, two pages uh, survey to see if you're fit or not to have a family pet. So that's also the downsides of shelter and regulation. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not, it's it could be universal, but it's not even Euro European. So to can uh, have or every member state can have their own shelter regulation, you can have a pet or you can't. So in Belgium, then people go on the internet and they get a puppy or a dog from a shelter from abroad with all the problems we see. Badly vaccinated, uh, carrying diseases, carrying parasites over the borders. Uh, so every day 
during the pandemic, I saw at least one dog who was not properly vaccinated uh, against rabies, uh, was not properly uh, treated for parasites. So I think we really have to make people aware what it means to get a dog from another country or a cat, uh, look into the local market and also try to get more it's a little bit contraindicated, I think, if I want to have more breeders uh, in the world, but breeders should be uh, organized as well. There should be legislation. Uh, they should get um, an education. So you cannot put just one litter on the on the world. You, you have to be uh, educated. Um, so we have to educate as well the breeders, the shelters, and the new pet owners. I think it's a whole uh, one, yeah. It's one thing we need that everybody has to take his responsibility. So that's why I'm here for to claim that everybody of us uh, from the higher level to the work floor takes his responsibility also as vets. That's why I'm here. Thank you, Anne. May I ask uh, Paolo to continue? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, of course, it is uh, my obligation to thank the organization of this important event on behalf of the Director General of the World Organization for Animal Health. We are very pleased to contribute to this discussion and actually to see uh, how uh, well are valorized the new standards that has been adopted recently uh, the general session related to the management of the dog population. Uh, it is important to remind that those are recommendations that propose tools for intervention to protect human and animal health, welfare and security. And of course, it's also very important to remind that they provide support for the implementation of disease control programs, including rabies, like it has been uh, uh, nicely presented by our, uh, our colleague. Actually, <clears throat> I thank you for, for considering me an expert on this field. I have to say that uh, well, I have a certain experience on that, and I went through the policy guidelines. I find them uh, extremely interesting, uh, and uh, actually they, they fully took uh, uh, on board the conceptual framework and the operational structure of what is proposed by the standards. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, we, it is clear, uh, there is a full consensus at any level, that a system should be in place. And uh, therefore, I would uh, strongly suggest to consider the need of involving uh, other competent authorities uh, in the management of dog population when the case uh, uh, is needed. Like you said, Peter, for instance, other ministry, not necessarily veterinary services. Uh, then the policy uh, guides also very strongly uh, highlight the importance of um, individual uh, responsibility towards animals and it's nice to see that uh, the approach towards potential owners of dogs are taken into account as a very important step. Unfortunately, uh, I would say that I don't see very often investments in this uh, direction because uh, this, this, uh, uh, this approach takes time and uh, needs a long, medium to long term uh, uh, objectives um, as much as uh, uh, policies for the adoptions of animals. That means that we should uh, avoid as much as possible to offer as the only opportunity for dogs and cats uh, conditions like, for instance, the shelters that they can be as much as uh, well organized as you, as you want. I have been personally dealing with this, but they will be never the, 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 the good solution for an animal. And in this regard, I would strongly highlight an important point with uh, I, I, I really welcome in the standards, uh, the concept of uh, an individual and collective ethical responsibility towards animals. The fact that we should involve all the communities in a reflection that is based on the animal welfare is not a negotiable position. Uh, no way animals must be treated according to the best standards. Nevertheless, communities around must be protected for collateral effects, including the possibility of uh, uh, disease spread. 
uh, with the, with this uh, the, the the also the, uh, the I, I think that if there is a gap uh, normally um, uh, seen while uh, trying to uh, pass from a conceptual to an operational framework is the link to the local municipalities. So the local authorities that uh, most of the time have the juridical position and uh, the legal obligation to operate in favor of the animals. And this step must be uh, taken uh, as a very important element uh, in order to improve the situation at uh, national level. And uh, the OOA uh, actually uh, operates uh, two programs uh, at the uh, European level, uh, including the uh, platform uh, on animal welfare for Europe that is actually proposing uh, um, capacity building uh, interventions and events, uh, offering tools for countries to assess their progressions towards the full implementation of the standards. And we uh, luckily uh, happily see the participation of some European Union countries that are making profit out of what the UOA is proposing for the welfare of animals and for the benefit of the communities. And I thank you so much again for having me here. Thank you. Well, there are very interesting tendencies, by the way, the uh, stray dogs uh, or uh, adoption or uh, more dogs uh, to be uh, brought to the uh, households. You remember uh, Corona closed down? There have been such a demand over the sudden for, especially for dogs, with, uh, with uh, whom you can walk uh, on the streets. <laughs> Others were not very much permitted. And it was steep increase, uh, especially in some shelters in, uh, in adoption. And now with the hardship coming to the social economic uh, that's a reality. Many families, unfortunately, can't sustain anymore. So we might see a tendency again that many, many dogs and cats uh, uh, will be found uh, found on the streets, and we will have to deal with this uh, <clears throat> issue among us. Um, please note, dear colleagues, that uh, we would uh, appreciate your answers to two questions on the poll that will help us understand the scope uh, population management issue. The first question is, are stray cats and dogs present in your country? Yes or no? You will have 10 minutes to answer this question and uh, we will have uh, then to move to the second question on the poll. So you can click and, uh, and find that question already probably in uh, uh, online. And now we have a, a good uh, uh, time to take uh, questions uh, online as well in uh, uh, in person uh, uh, among those present in this room. Um, from which we should start, uh, Andreas. I would suggest that we start first with the room yes. and uh, that we take then the questions online. Very good. So it's accepted and uh, I'm looking around for any indications uh, in, among those present here who wants to ask any question or make any comment? <laughs> Most welcome. <laughs> I was Always waiting for uh, not to jump uh, <laughs> in front of the ladies, maybe. Yes. Uh, <laughs> OK, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Claudio Dumitriu. I am representing the National Animal Welfare Federation from Romania. And uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'm happy that this issue is again of the agenda of the intergroup. Uh, from years, uh, I was uh, present uh, to many, uh, many very good uh, debates and. Uh, uh, and Mr. Erler is uh, is um, uh, a witness of all this <laughs> period, and uh, we uh, uh, showed uh, some of the solution, and we hoped that also Romania uh, will uh, come steps further in a very humane and uh, efficient uh, uh, way of handling. Also, with, with Mr. Dalavila met in the earlier times and uh, uh, we 
that away, but also, as Mr. Davida told us, some of the European countries take this, uh, uh, um, let's say, these measures and uh, uh, um, have consideration for this uh, way to do it. Um, um, it is very frustrating and it is very um, uh, sad that after all this time, uh, exactly now in the Romanian parliament, we try to change this ineffective and unhuman way. That means uh, catching uh, 14 days uh, staying in a shelter. And after that, <clears throat> the mayors who want to do it, they are not obliged to do it, but it is uh, let's say a very usual way to handling with uh, with uh, this kind of stradox, and in all these years, also we saw in Sofia uh, what means this kind of uh, approach, and how much it costs, and how inefficient, and it takes uh, uh, all the years are getting uh, again and no solution and no stop for the, for this problem, and that's why. Um, the question would be, uh, for example, uh, also for you, Mr. Chairman, as uh, uh, we know that it is, uh, it is a national issue, but uh, I think uh, maybe we should try uh, to um, bring to this debate uh, um, also Romanian colleagues, also Romanian authorities, maybe you take into consideration to visit us in Romania and make maybe a debate uh, together with uh, uh, OEA and Mr. Dalla Vila and his colleagues. Uh, and uh, that would be a question, what you see to, to uh, uh, recommend for a country that uh, doesn't uh, open uh, eyes and ears, and also for Mr. Dalla Vila as a specialist, uh, how he thinks we can uh, make a debate and uh, explain also again to the Romanian colleagues and authorities uh, uh, that uh, um, they are losing time, they are losing money, and most of all, uh, it is a huge cruelty and uh, 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 a lot of uh, victims that uh, we cannot support, you know, uh, to see all these years, they, there are some improvements, but uh, because these methods still exist, there is no political way to uh, and will to change it. And that's my, my uh, request. Maybe you can discuss with your colleagues and bring them, for example, uh, to these kind of uh, events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Indeed. I mean, maybe we can uh, consider your uh, first question or two questions you, you just made uh, um, uh, right now. Uh, thank you. I mean, this is very, uh, you made it very openly. I mean, you didn't uh, hide uh, any issues or problems uh, which uh, still exist in, in, in Romania in this regard. You know what, uh, what I did when I was a member of national parliament? I organized association. I mean, it was, uh, let's say, beginning of uh, 2000. And I started to speak about this issue publicly. I mean, I created a certain public narrative that uh, animal welfare must be treated as an important issue because before it, it wasn't like, I mean, come on, there are more important issues. I mean, new bridges, uh, streets, uh, schooling, and so on and so forth. So it must be some lobbyist in the national parliament or senate of, uh, of Romania, those dedicated people, they shouldn't be many, but some positively crazy, I would say, <laughs> in this regard. I mean, you know, uh, mobilized by uh, this great idea that uh, you make uh, um, uh, change uh, in this regard. And, um, uh, you know, you, you... then we started, I mean, to have meetings. We started to invite uh, uh, government officials. Uh, we went uh, uh, to visit uh, shelters and, uh, you know, ambitions, I mean, they raise different issues like uh, food um, industry, you know, uh, problems and so on and so forth. But, you know, I mean, they exist. And I, I don't know, I mean, uh, is there any such a lobbying group uh, in Romanian parliament? Maybe we should uh, empower them or invite them to become uh, uh, those positive because, I mean, it should come from inside. I mean, you can't impose, uh, you know, kind of new measures, new, 
uh, guidelines if there is no local interest and cooperation then it, it is very complicated so i wonder maybe we can have online discussion with some romanian uh, politicians members of parliament if you give us uh, any names uh, we can arrange this I, <laughs> I i have to admit that i had some problems with some romanian maps members of european parliament with whom i couldn't agree on animal welfare they said no 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 it's not a not a problem i said it is a problem he said, no, it's not a problem. Hmm? Okay, so, no. <laughs> oh, really? So, but, I mean, maybe we, sh uh, we should break uh, this uh, kind of uh, icy, <laughs> icy situation. I mean, um, trying I mean, to show them good examples, good practices. I mean, to twin them with some uh, active uh, people, politicians in other countries. I mean, there are very dedicated groups of politicians. And maybe we can uh, start moving something. So, if you have... Uh, any good names or people we can uh, uh, we can contact uh, in uh, in uh, in Bucharest uh, in order to ask them to move forward, I would appreciate. I mean, sometimes it uh, it makes things moving very smoothly once you have this kind of cooperation. Oh, it should be yes. I mean, uh, you, you you can't you know commit people if uh, if they have no interest and uh, because it's really something uh, extra i mean to your uh, direct uh, responsibilities mm -hmm. but um i have very good examples in this regard and uh, i'm very optimistic uh, because of this and we even organized some regional conferences in the baltic countries i i have to admit inviting even some which are not part of the Euro european union like for example um belarus and, and and the rest i wouldn't say i mean they followed our examples much but i mean first attempt First attempt. Really? Okay. So, but um, if you have uh, those names from uh, Bucharest, I would be really happy I mean, to get in touch and to see what we can do on this political, let's say, and um, uh, national level. Uh, Paola, you've even given a question as well. Thank you, Claudio, for, for your con considerations in my capacities. But <laughs> to, to make a, a punctual comment on this, uh, uh, it would be needed to have a clear understanding of the situation of your country in terms of uh, evidences and all the elements for making uh, uh, this kind of uh, advice, which is not the case. Whereas uh, I would suggest uh, you, uh, you know, picking up uh, the comment of the chairman, to uh, try to engage uh, all the stakeholders that are really meant uh, to be involved uh, in uh, uh, dog population management. And uh, uh, in relation to the effects they may have uh, on the different perception of uh, uh, your, your people towards animals, because at the end, it's very much a matter of valuing them. And in this case, uh, I would share a little bit, perhaps uh, the frustration with my veterinary colleague uh, representing the federation is that um, and this is really my experience most of the time this issue is seen uh, as a, a very much technical issue but you know we veterinarians we know how to do it and what to do it and we normally do it very well uh, the point is that uh, there is a, a much larger space and uh, uh, a, 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 an important role for the societal dimension of, the, of these uh, uh, of these uh, problem that is actually perceived in a different way because it is a very much a matter of how it is perceived animal welfare uh, cannot be defined a problem or cannot be seen uh, cannot be said if it is important or, or not it is there and animals deserve consideration uh, at any level uh, this means that it is important to open the discussion, involve the stakeholders, and the difficulty is to proactively involve the ones that are against the, 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 the way you try to approach and change the system. Because the change in the system uh, uh, should be proposed in, in a way of a progressive, incremental way. Uh, because it has been said, not by me, that animal welfare is not a revolution, it's an evolution. Society is going in this direction, so I believe that uh, slowly we should uh, we should be confident on this, and we should actually value what we achieved, 
And uh, from my perspective, uh, Claudio, already the fact that you are having uh, a legislation, a specific legislation on this matter that is pretty recent, it's a, a good sign. Then, of course, there are elements for implementation of the legislation. Uh, I have heard very many times that uh, resources are needed, but it has to be uh, transparently said that sometimes uh, resources are there and are not <coughs> properly allocated. Uh, most of the time there are very good resources that are not activated, so it is very much a way of collaborating in a constructive manner. And I mean, all the efforts in this, uh, in this regard uh, can, will, be, will be supported also on our side, for sure. Thank you, Paolo. We can move now to online questions. There is quite a yeah, there few are of them. Few yeah. of yes. them. So the first Andreas. one comes from Eric Ringstrom, uh, and is it is a question for Petya. He wanted uh, to say, you mentioned uh, that it does not cost anything to adopt uh, at, uh, at shelters in Sofia. Uh, do you have any cooperation with any adoption organizations uh, that export the dogs from Bulgaria? Do they pay anything uh, for the dogs? Petya, are you with us? Uh, yes, we work with two organizations and uh, they don't pay anything uh, for the dogs. Thank you. Well, I think she she she, she replied to it. So we can move to another question. Um, by uh, Valentina Bagnato, who asks, how can NGO persuade countries still convinced that the mass killing of strays is still the right solution to reduce and control their population? The NGOs? This is the NGOs. I'm, they, I'm happy to to have a go unless I can't see actually if there are any other hands raised on the at the table in the room. No. So can so you just I can repeat the question? Yeah. Yes, uh, please. How yes. can NGOs persuade countries still convinced that the mass killing of strays? is still the right solution to re reduce and control the population? Well, um, I think for certainly in, in, in the EU and most European countries have outlawed um, killing of, of animals for, for population as a means of population control. And it's something that is not longer acceptable in 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 Europe, and I think um, I don't I don't know if you can just certainly from a from a, an ethical point of view. I think it's it's there isn't very much convincing that that we need to do that. I think you know it's it's it is clear to me that and and I don't know if if um, I, I don't think. It, and we know that not not only is is um, killing dogs as a method of population control and cats not effective, but it's it's, it's not acceptable. And it's it's I don't think we we should you know we, we we don't want to talk in that context anymore. I just I think how can we convince the the how how can we motivate the the and mobilize the political will and political momentum and this is what the colleague from Romania has been talking about but what the, the frustrating bit is the frustrating bit for us is why why aren't we there yet we know we have the tools we have the know-how we have the resources we have the 
you know, in many instances, we have the European citizens and the public engage and wanting us and willing us to do to do better. And why aren't we still, you know, why aren't we still, why are we still here and why are we still finding certainly on the ground and encountering um, challenges? And I think for me, how can we convince the authorities that they need to take a very different view and a very different long term approach to population management? How can we convince um, how can we convince authorities that the quick fixes don't work and that you know we are forever going to be you know we are forever going to be firefighting unless uh, there is a real there is a real effort and a real um, um, you know really concentrated effort to develop permanent systems and services. That can that are built into the you know that are a, a government service that are a public service that are part of the municipal services uh, that are well invested into and resourced and that can be delivering this as a community service to the level that is needed to protect human welfare animal welfare and and that is fu fundamentally um, working towards a population of um, dogs and cats that is controlled, that is working towards um, um, investing into education and, and ownership uh, where every animal has a good home and where in the, uh, animals are owned um, and kept in the way that they ought to be kept, where we have a uh, very strong emphasis on, on on the root causes, we know in Europe, and from my personal experience of working in Europe, you know, there is a, you know, the, the control of breeding and selling of animals is a real problem. We have, you know, we have lots of, you know, I think lots, lots of problems that that we are currently facing are sometimes linked to, you know, fewer people poorly regulated bre breeding and selling of animals, which are forever, you know, adding to that, that, um, that population of animals that eventually, you know, end up on the street. So I think it's a much more than just convincing. I think we, we, we you know, culling and, and killing animals as a means of population control doesn't work and it's not acceptable. And, and I think maybe this is something that is also better illustrated in the stages that we'd like countries to go through. And I believe that in the EU, every country can and should reach the stage four. <laughs> so I think, you know, I and I, it's it's it is the political will is is very important, and investing in the right in the right investing resources in the right services that can, you know, that can deliver that change that we need to see. I think too often we have sporadic interventions and resources that are you know mis misdirected i suppose but i think the political will to to change things for you know for good is is absolute paramount i don't know there are other ngo colleagues in the room and, and um at the table so they might be to contribute i, I know something. this is a general ngo question Yes. Uh, so regarding your question, I will uh, refer also to Romania. I'm, I'm also representing an uh, NGO from Romania. Uh, in our country, the dogs are still killed after 14 days in the shelter, uh, in the conditions that mo most of the shelters are not promoting those dogs to be adopted. I mean, now we're fighting to change just a little bit of the law and uh, add at least the the the, the, the obligation of the shelters to promote the dogs on the online environment because uh, the law was uh, adopted in 2001 and from 2001 still, till now uh, the, the evolution of the uh, online environment increased so much that it's not acceptable from my point of view not to have those dogs promoted uh, on the online and not to give them a, a chance to be adopted and uh, still we use this uh, inhumane method uh, 
uh, and uh, just uh, last week uh, regarding the political will, uh, this is a part of the reason we are here because we tried everything and tried to convince the political parties with all the arguments, with the, with the numbers, with the rational and human arguments, and uh, we are uh, facing a wall of uh, of uh, defense of against our idea that is not and is not efficient and is not a, a correct use of the public money and so on. And uh, in 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 this point, uh, I, I know that uh, your role is not to intervene in a, in a country policies, but we we feel that we need uh, some kind of a. Uh, uh, a third party that can intervene and can confirm the, the things that we are hearing here. And I'm very happy that everyone is sharing our opinion that uh, the, the correct way is to address the, the unsterilized dog and the dogs that don't have a, a microchip, they, they cannot be determined to, uh, to a certain owner. Uh, but right now, the truth is that in our country, we have uh, from three and a half million uh, registered dog, dogs in the in the, in, uh, in the in the in the registered dog uh, database. Only uh, five hundred thousand are registered. So basically, only fifteen percent uh, of those dogs are registered are, are sterilized. I'm sorry. So only fifteen percent of all the dogs owned in Romania are right now are 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 sterilized. So we are fighting a battle that we cannot win and uh, the 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 answer of the mayors that are uh, just send uh, their point of view or, or to the to the parliament they their position was that uh, they are uh, uh, totally against eliminating uh, the the killing of the dogs from the law and we are now in in this point that we we basically need something maybe to assign maybe your case studies, maybe everyone experienced here to help us to go forward and to to stop this uh, this cruel and inefficient uh, uh, dog population management strategy that uh, shows uh, showed is uh, in in uh, inefficiency in the in the last uh, ten years. Thank you. Thank you, Paola. You wanted to intervene. Uh, thank you, Peter. Yes, I would like to compliment uh, what it has been said <clears throat> on the basis of my experience, on, on, uh, on the basis of the standards, because uh, if we talk about uh, dog population management in a preventative manner, uh, looking at the uh, causes, we should recognize that um, in, I believe that also NGO should buy the importance of identification and registration of the animals and traceability of the animals as the first step, the basis on which you can plan everything. And this, uh, I, can, uh, I can tell, it, it, it is what I have seen from my perspective. When the NGO took the lead of this, in the sense of uh, uh, contributing to uh, put in place uh, this essential measure in order to understand uh, who is the owner of this dog and besides the ownership, who is responsible for this dog, then it is clear that, you know, you divide the waters and you can uh, literally understand where you should uh, actually invest your, your resources and uh, tackle these issues that, uh, as you said, uh, uh, are upcoming, like uh, the internet selling of animals that should be uh, put clearly under control, because this is a very important element also. Uh, but still uh, to uh, recognize the importance of knowing how many animals you have, where are these animals, who is owning these animals, what is the level of responsibility of the individual or institutional levels towards these animals. And these are clearly, uh, these, are, uh, these elements are clearly stated in the new standards that by the way now introduce a, a new terminology. It's important to remind that now according to the standards, we are not talking anymore about stray dogs, but free roaming dogs. And this is very important because uh, uh, from our perspective and standards are based on science, evidences, you know, the contribution of international experts and all the countries that are 182 that approve those standards. These are both owned and unowned dogs that are recognized as without direct human control. 
So this is very important to let you understand that sometimes you are dealing with the population that apparently is unowned, but in reality has an owner behind. Thank you. So may I announce first results of the poll. Uh, 37 votes. And no surprise, 84%. Yes, there are stray dogs or really roaming, uh, roamed uh, dogs, uh, cats and dogs in, in uh, your country. And no, 16%. It's quite a, a clear picture by this. Uh, the question will be, which one? Andreas. This one, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do policymakers do enough to effectively manage populations of cats and dogs in your country? Definitely, yes or no. Once again, do policymakers, as uh, we just had a, an exchange with our Romanian colleagues, do enough to effectively manage populations of cats and dogs? Yes or no? Again, some 10 minutes for replies would be very much appreciated. And to continue on uh, the uh, case of, uh, of Romania, you know what we do <clears throat> in Lithuania? Before any campaign, before any elections, we approach political parties, asking them to reply to five or six questions about the animal world. What are their points of view, their policy line, and what they are going to do? towards increasing uh, the animal welfare standards in, in the country. And uh, some reply, some not, of course, but then we publish. We publish uh, replies, we publish it uh, online uh, as a kind of coalition of uh, uh, NGOs uh, uh, for uh, animal welfare, and we present to, you know, for voters. It's up to you to decide. I mean, some, uh, some parties don't have a policy line, some have, it's your choice. I mean, uh, pick up yourself. I mean, uh, it's one of the criteria to probably to vote. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, but even for, even for local elections, it works. Not to speak about national elections. For local elections, especially because people know, uh, know it, I mean, from daily experience that, I mean, they see some, um, uh, you know, situations uh, they like or, uh, or they don't. So that's why it, it is a kind of very good orientation for politicians to, you know, to uh, wake up and, and to see uh, a need for uh, something to be done, um, uh, to be promised, committed, and then to be implemented after, after elections, especially when you are in ruling coalition. Andreas, I think we have more yeah, questions so to come. The, the next question comes from my colleague uh, Ivona. Uh, who, Martin, who um, asks, uh, do you think that all cats and dogs should be identified by a microchip and their owners' uh, details registered in a database so that uh, both can be traced uh, if, for example, a pet is lost, missold, abandoned, or stolen? Uh, that would have a direct impact on uh, stray numbers and re re reunification rates. Who wants to begin? Yeah, I can start. Yes, we do. <laughs> There's no question about it. Uh, it would solve a lot of problems. Um, and yeah, no, that's not uh, the only thing. We, we really need uh, a more European database because now they're all uh, pieces and, and, and pots that some, some pots are closed and we can uh, enter. Um, so it would uh, also be more useful in tra to trace the trait of the dogs. Um, so we, we need a, another kind of database, I think. You, now you have traces, but that's only for the, for the co com uh, commercial trait. So there you can find a lot of uh, registered dogs. Uh, but that's not where we want to end. We want to see that every dog on the street or every dog in a household or cat has a microchip. Um, and then the second level, I'm going to take misuse this uh, this opportunity. 
we it would really help everybody if we end up with an electronic passport for every dog. This is a, something I wanted to ask and tell and spread for years already, because then also everything of the vaccination of the dog, the antiparasitic uh, things he had, his whole uh, life could be on that electronic passport hooked on the electronic chip. Uh, so a transponder is the is the way to go, uh, because on the transporters uh, that the microchips that are now in the dogs, there is a lot of space left to put extra information. So I think it's we we should use that. Um, so um, yeah, and then you can cross at the airport with your dog. He goes through a, through a channel and he gets green or red. Green, okay, you can take him with you because. See that his uh, rabies vaccine and every paper is all and his certificate are okay. And if he has a red light, then you have to have a backup from the family to take the dog home, and you cannot travel with him. So I think if we see now in the pandemic how easy it is to make app and to produce apps all around Europe to travel for people, it, it doesn't go to my mind only if I'm only a veterinarian that. It's not possible to do that for dogs as well, dogs and cats. Cat on this issue. No? Andreas, can you continue? So the next question comes from uh, Catherine Lola from uh, Ireland. She asks, uh, what are member states' experiences of trap neutral release return programs for cats? Okay, so uh, I, I, uh, I am situated, situated, yeah, I'm living in Belgium, that's easier to say. Um, so we don't have uh, stray dogs at all. We have maybe some stray cats, but m most of them are feral cats, I think, if we knew uh, the new uh, term. Um, and in Belgium, it's uh, mandatory to... Uh, uh, register and um, uh, identify your cat for a few years now already, and they go into a database as well. Um, the other side of the of our legislation is that uh, young cats has to be neutered very early before they get into new families, so before 15 weeks. I must say that that is a bit a little bit double, but because I think that we will end up uh, maybe in a in a that we don't find uh, a family cat as easy as we should. Uh, but on the other hand, um, so another thing, very important thing, is that we see in practice is that a stray cat or a feral cat often likes to stay a feral cat. Um, because they, it, it depends on where they come from. When they were uh, born on the street or in the, on the farm, you trap them, you neuter them, you ident identify them, and you put them back. Uh, for the cats, sometimes, depending on the age, it's more welfare than to take them into a house, to, t to put them in a shelter for a few weeks and then give them to another, uh, another family. Because especially for cats, they are really, cats are not small dogs. Cats are frustrated very easily. They can hide for weeks, months. Then we, in practice, we hear, yeah, I got the, the kitten from the, or cat from the shelter, and he's so nice, he doesn't move from his chair. The whole day he's on his chair. That's a really stressed cat. He doesn't dare to come from the chair or from the cupboard. He, he stays there the whole day because he thinks he's mo the most, uh, yeah, safe, uh, high, high on the on the cupboard. So that's another question we should should answer. I think a real feral cat would, or is better to stay a feral cat and not to come into a household. Not all, but it's not the owners. They they cannot see it. So it should be specialists that say, okay, maybe it's better for your cat if she pees in the house. She wants to know you that she wants to live outside. It's outside and not inside the house. So it's for cats. It's I have a cat only clinic. Cats are 
really special special species you can you, you can you you can't ask them but you really need to learn to read them so yeah those those programs where they put them then in into a shelter or or in a uh, rehab rehab home they should be inspected and they should be licensed and people who work with cats should have a special training really it's it's not the same as a dog we're learning a lot. Uh, Alexandra and Petya, uh, you have a lot of practical experience as well. I mean, can you share with uh, the cats uh, issue we just started to discuss? I will have to pass on this one and I wonder whether maybe the colleagues from, because I, I'm really, my expertise is mainly with dogs, so I'm really not the person to talk about cats, but I wonder whether this is now an opportunity for the Portuguese organization to talk a little bit more about about the case study and maybe say a few few words. They're most welcome to join. If they're, I think they're in the room, but. Um... <coughs> uh, I can. Uh, yeah, uh, I can give the words to Margarita. Uh, she is uh, incorporated in uh, castration with cats and uh, here is she is. Hello, because we are talking about cats, I just first of all want to agree that the cats are not little dogs and the cat identification must be mandatory. Uh, CNVR, TNVR actions, they are not working well. When does the community is not engaged with uh, with the whole problem with the cats? Uh, in 2020, Sofia municipality asked uh, for polls for the expertise over the stray cats because, for example, Sofia municipality they are not working with stray cats. They are planning to do that, but they need somebody to help them. What is our uh, um, expertise about CNVR activities? Uh, over the cats. The CNVR activities, like in dogs, they are not working if the uh, community is not engaged into the whole process. Uh, with the dogs, it's much easier to reduce the population than with the stray cats using CNVR and TNVR activities. So, this is what we believe, especially for Bulgaria and for the other countries in Eastern Europe where we, the stray cat problem arises, is that after the, the dog population is decreased with uh, uh, CNVR, uh, catch vaccinate nutrient release activities, sorry for using abbreviators, and uh, when the stray cat population uh, increased is to engage the community, the local stakeholders, the whole, um, the municipalities, and also, if possible, to the, all the measurements to stop the increase of, of the population using human methods. Thank you, Paolo. And excuse me, just because another question arises, and it is also good for the cats. Um, before that, you asked uh, the Sofia municipality representative about the um, uh, animal welfare uh, related issues in schools. Uh, Petya doesn't know that, but uh, for Paul supports Sofia municipality in this way again, uh, as well, sorry. Uh, we are working with the regional mayors who are responsible for the schools in Sofia. So we have a program called uh, Children Learn How to Protect Animals. And yes, the animal welfare topics uh, and also the topics that are related with uh, stray dogs and stray cats are um, uh, part of this educational program. Um, what else which we found as a good example is um, during the, the time of the pandemic, we created a video related to the stray cats. And the video is about the children, or the children, the teenagers, uh, that is related also with uh, um, stray cats and how we can help with managing stray cat population. So this is uh, this is what we can say at the moment. Yes, we continue. So we continue to work with um, our the um, stray cat issues. Thank you, Paolo. 
Thank you, Peter. So having said that uh, the OA has no standards on uh, cat uh, population management, and uh, having uh, strongly underlined that, uh, as we are saying, there are uh, substantial differences between uh, dog and cat populations in terms of, dog eco of cat ecology and cat population dynamics. Uh, I can uh, suggest uh, uh, our uh, uh, participant from Ireland to have a look to the Italian experience, because Italy uh, took since 1991 uh, the norm that establishes that uh, stray cats must be managed uh, on the territory. Uh, so uh, they cannot be kept uh, in catteries or uh, shelters uh, unless for uh, uh, mandatory uh, checks uh, made by veterinary services, and then they must be released uh, uh, on the places where they are uh, caught. So uh, the legislation is in place since very many years now, and there are very good experiences that uh, are showing you that the system works, considering that uh, there are, uh, as I said, substantial differences to be taken into account. And in this regard, uh, I, I brought it uh, to my colleague here, it is a 2021 paper published uh, recently, and this is about public opinions on seven different stray cat population management scenarios in Belgium, which means that uh, there are different <laughs> options here proposed, including the catch neuter release one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paolo. So we can move to and one the, more. The next. The uh, question is from Irina Molfesi from Greece, uh, who says, uh, is FECAVER officially positioning itself against cross-border adoptions in general? And if this is the case, uh, why uh, do they not uh, specify what countries present uh, a threat and increase control at borders rather than condemning all cross-border adoptions? Um, I, I think as as Fikava, we don't um, we don't we are not completely against cross border uh, adoptions, but I think it's necessary to control them a little bit more uh, than in this stage. I think uh, because um, often we see two young puppies um, and the problems of of zoonotic diseases and um, are are sometimes not enough um, recognized and not enough uh, supported. Um, and I think we need as well maybe a European uh, list of, of the, the most uh, active uh, organizations who do cross-border uh, adoptions because I think I never seen that list or a list like that so we have no clue uh, often where dogs come from and who are, are, are responsible for the transport of those dogs. So I think uh, there are a lot of gaps uh, also in the cross-border adoptions. And maybe we should really, and we can do that as FECAVA, I think, because we have all the European um, um, small animal associations under our umbra umbrella. We could do uh, easily do a survey to see uh, in which countries, which NGOs or which orga organizations do most uh, cross-border cross uh, adoptions. So if you want, we can, we can start uh, this uh, survey for sure. And then we can uh, yeah, see what the results are. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, well, again, referring to the standards, they, they actually provide recommendations, uh, very strong recommendations uh, to keep under control uh, the movement uh, of uh, uh, dogs, in this case, uh, uh, within the country and uh, uh, across countries. And this is very much in relation to what my colleague already said. Uh, it is clear that animals are bringing with themselves uh, potential risks for public health. And uh, we are seeing um, actually situations where um, infectious and parasitic diseases that were not uh, present in some countries uh, are now present there and uh, this poses uh, additional uh, additional uh, 
problems to these uh, to these uh, uh, um, to this op um, option of dealing with the management of stray dogs, which is uh, clearly positive in sense of goodwill. But uh, our message is that uh, the health of those animals and the welfare must be clearly and carefully assessed, and these animals must be in the condition to be uh, moved. Thank you. Andreas, do we have more questions? Yes, there are further <laughs> questions. The next question. No <laughs> How can I say? Confidence. <laughs> it's quite. The next question is from Jana Narodowska, uh, who says, um, thanks uh, for the interesting uh, presentations. Um, scientific publications uh, report that the main centers of illegal dog breeding are, are located in Central and Eastern Europe. It is reported that organized crime groups are involved in such activities. Have, have any speakers in particular from Eastern or Central Europe encountered uh, this phenomenon? If yes, how the activities of organized crime groups look like? Okay, so um, I, I don't really know how those networks, but uh, I can tell you then in Eastern countries, one of the main phenomenon that uh, doesn't really have a solution or a control in this moment uh, is the selling of the dogs over the internet. Uh, there are a lot of public websites where you can sell everything from TVs to furniture and also on those websites are lots of dogs that uh, don't have any doc documents or they don't, uh, they are not raised in uh, some good conditions. And this is one thing that uh, of, of course needs to be addressed together with uh, the, the dog management strategy because we cannot increase the desire to adopt uh, a dog from from one of our shelters while uh, any person has an option to buy with 10 euros or so a so-called uh, pure breed dog from the internet and uh, again i think we 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 need to to to, to we have a lot of work to do on this area and we need to, the police and uh, the authorities that are in charge of controlling and destructure uh, those those uh, uh, those those net network to do their job, because otherwise it's pretty hard for us as NGOs to fight with them, and uh, it's pretty easy to to just search on the internet and to find w w which are the those people that are. Uh, mm -hmm daily selling uh, those yes. uh, those dogs yes. on the internet so we have a problem but again we don't have a solution in Romania for that if um, mr. chair if I might just add yes. something sorry Most I welcome. just <laughs> thank you I just wanted to say really that we are really now um, addressing some of the most important factors i think in in a way we are where the main challenges in europe certainly are are you know are happening and i think um my colleague paolo already mentioned the importance of identification and registration and really getting that traceability and now the issue of breeding and selling has also been been um raised and i think both really are going to unless those those two in my view absolutely critical um, issues are effectively addressed through legislation and enforcement. Um, I think we are forever going to be, you know, um, firefighting and 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 because I think those those two are the most important sources of um, most important sources of. Um, that contributes to the unwanted populations of, of animals in the countries that are, you know, still still facing and still de dealing with visible. And I saw the percentage was quite high where the 
people are reporting still dealing with visible dog and cat cat populations. So I think animal identification and registration and the control of breeding and selling are absolute are of paramount importance and absolute prerequisites to um, successfully and effectively addressing the addressing the issue in Europe at least. And um, yes, I think those those really are the, the the factors that significantly contribute and that unless we unless we close the tap really we are forever going to be you know processing and dealing with the symptoms so yes i just wanted to to you know highlight those two as, as really the most salient and most important um, areas i think that we need to address further through legislation and, and good implementation and enforcement thank you Thank you. Just to recognize that uh, we see this uh, challenge as a big problem, no doubt, from our group, from uh, Animal Welfare Group. And we plan to visit uh, The Hague, uh, the Interpol headquarters, because not uh, every time uh, illegal uh, trade of animals is recognized as a kind of organized crime activity. It is neglected, mm -hmm. downsized. But uh, financially, it's, it's a big issue. Bill billions i mean go here and there uh, not to speak about the uh, animal welfare but as well as risks arising for public health because uh, those animals have been crossed sometimes many many borders uh, in europe so we're going to follow this issue in order to um, highlight the uh, most important elements and in order to find uh, possible solutions because it's not just the national cooperation among the different institutions. It must be international cooperation as well to identify, to uh, go after, as well as to prevent any of those crimes, and we should call it as a crime, indeed, uh, uh, from happening. So that's why maybe we will come up later with some, hopefully uh, this year, with some uh, conclusions and some uh, information you, you will be uh, able to, to receive as well. Andreas, we we are a bit uh, time uh, squeezed. Uh, can we have one more question? If we will have more questions, we will try to uh, reply to you in written. Okay, so if it uh, goes well with you, maybe we can uh, take one more question and then go to a bit to the end of this session. Well, there is one um, by Ellie Hibi who says, we have heard today how important sterilization of owned dogs and cats can be, as this addresses unwanted litters, uh, which are uh, a source of future free roaming. Many owners are willing to have their animal sterilized, but uh, lack uh, access uh, to these services. What can be done to improve access to sterilization services? in particular in Eastern Europe, where access to these services seems particularly limited. Is it true? Uh, is it true? I mean, lack of strange, a little bit strange. Um, uh, all of this said, I have to hook to you because my camera is not working. <laughs> he said. But anyhow, it's a little bit strange remark, I think, and um, that's also the, the the one thing we as veterinarians tell uh, the future owners um, to think about before they get an animal in the house, before they get a pet. It doesn't start with get, but getting the, the cat or the dog in the household. You have, there are responsibilities that come with that. And so if you have a cat and she's not new, neutered, it's your responsibility as an owner to make sure that she's neutered. And of course, we as vets, we have more than a hobby. Um, it's our it's our life, it's our job. Um, we need to have of to earn some money to, to survive as well. So I'm now 32 years in the field as a veterinarian and, and people often look at me as I as I'm God, because I want to save their cat or their dog, and I want to neuter. But then, when they have, they get the invoice, they 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 think I'm a criminal, and I'm a, I uh, I don't know what I'm asking, and uh, so that's also part of the of the 
the thing that people have to know if you get a dog, a cat, even if you find a cat, kitten on the street and you think, oh, this is a nice kitten, I'm going, it's going to make it mine kitten, then it starts by putting a microchip, register the, the cat or the dog, put it in the database, deworm it, uh, take flea, the fleas under control, vaccinate it, and then in the end, it has to be nutrient and it has to be sterilized or, or castrated. So that's the, the, and if you don't have the money, I'm not saying that, that people who don't have money uh, cannot have a, a, a pet as a friend because then I will be killed when, as soon as I leave the building. But there is, there are some res responsibilities, and if you count in, in a lot of questions, in a lot of countries like in Belgium, we have uh, our Prince Laurent, who uh, is a really animal lover, and he has his corporation. And if you really don't have money, you can go and ask if somebody can do it for free in shelters. Kittens are often uh, nurtured for free as well, or on a low price. But on the other hand. It's the responsibility of the new owner to keep his pet. And and what I hear from from stray dogs that are captured, neutered, and then released, they get deworming once. My question is, why once? Okay, um, you cannot you cannot take them in every every year to to get their deworming, but. The one deworming will not make the difference, and maybe the deworming can go to the the the, the amount of money of a deworming can be used for a microchip because I don't think that microchip, as such, is such a big investment. That's 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 one thing I wanted to say as well. A chip, a microchip, doesn't have to cost fortunes. To me, it's I I, I don't know. Don't shoot me if I'm wrong, but. It doesn't cost a lot, to, and it doesn't cost a lot to put in it as well. It takes one second, and the microchip is in. But then it starts, then it has to be registered. It has to go to the right database, and it has to be looked at. That's two different things. But as an owner, a new owner, whatever you take in the house, even if it's a, if it's a hamster or a caviar or, or a, I don't know what, or a, a rabbit, it's your responsibility. You have to take care of it as long as it lives. That's my what I said when I started. It's, it's a, the lifetime of your pet, not your lifetime. It's the lifetime of your pet you have to take care of. So I, I don't think that the price of the nutrient can be a, an issue. Um, and, and you have to you have to ask before you get or you have to ask yourself can we can we uh, do we have the the money for a pet because it also has to eat as well. If I can just give a short uh, answer from our perspective from Eastern Europe, we did campaigns uh, with uh, plenty of NGOs and we went to door to door, especially on the countryside. And we told them that we will sterilize and micro and put a microchip for free, and still they didn't do it. And uh, until the, the law will be enforced and uh, somebody will go and check if the dog is sterilized or not after after we offer the possibility to do it for free, and still they don't do it. And I don't know, give a warning, and then after a month, give a fine or something. We are, we are fighting a battle that we cannot win. So the the problem of infor enforcing a, a, a law, it's, it's, if we have a law, we have a, a mandatory law that force the owners of uh, uh, the dogs that are not from a certain breed to be sterilized. But if the law is not enforced, we cannot fight the unwanted puppies that are uh, thrown every day hundred thousand or thousands that we need to, to take from the field and to, to support. Thank you. Paul, I know you have to leave uh, soon, but uh, maybe you have some final um, uh, remark. Well, well, my very final remark is that I believe, uh, really, I think it has been a, a very nice discussion. I think all the elements are there. And uh, I also, what I want to stress is that, you know, they are well understood. We know where we are, and from from here we should really all together with the best of our intention and capacities to work together to a common goal. Minimal steps, but I mean this will be uh, will make a big change, provided that 
from my perspective, it is very much a cultural matter. And I can tell you, I have experienced personally situations where, for instance, during the tragic L'Aquila earthquake time, we have been subsidizing sterilization of dogs for free. People did not do it because this is something in their brain that is not acceptable. So the concept and, um, and the concept is that it is important that within the responsibility of an owner is the concept of controlling the reproduction of your animal and the destiny, potential destiny of the puppies. So we should work for a cultural shift in the direction of considering animals for what we are and humans for what they are. And I believe that all of us can play a role, including the World Organization for Animal Health. Thank you for inviting me. It's been really a great pleasure. It was a pleasure to have you, Paola, and to have your comments. And I'm looking forward for our future cooperation as well. And will be more to come. Um, at this point, probably we have to stop taking more questions. Uh, Andreas promised to reply in written. <laughs> He's committed to this. Um, and to coordinate also with uh, with uh, speakers, uh, the speakers, uh, um, because uh, the the questions were addressed to different um, people. So yeah, that's right. So we will we will do it in a due course. And uh, now I uh, I have to read uh, the results of our second poll, uh, reminding you that the question was: Do policy makers do enough uh, to effectively manage populations of cats and dogs with answers yes and no yes 17 no 83 very much in uh, um, compatible with the previous one uh, was as you remember 84 16 so there is a space for improvement and uh, here we probably uh, agree with no any further debate needed uh, in this regard so I'm very uh, thankful to all of you who took part in uh, those two polls. It's a clear indication, a kind of our indication for our uh, path uh, uh, in future in this regard for new commitments and new projects to be implemented and our cooperation to be continued. So let me to make some very final closing remarks because we're approaching uh, the final um, minute of our meet meeting. Um, as you have seen in these presentations and discussions, the guide provides a conceptual journey from stray control through to effective population management that is integrated into the regulations and social norms. It aims to equip anyone dealing with population management control and to ensure progress for the sake and welfare of animals and society as a whole. We are all aware that uh, dog and cat populations vary significantly between within countries as such as human attitudes and behaviors towards dogs and cats hence and there is no single one intervention that will work for all situations a stray population assessment is necessary which allows for an evidence-based program design we will ensure a tailor-made approach for each location involving uh, uh, the local communities. All this should be mentioned and evaluated so as to track progress. Population management policies should aim at identifying and addressing the sources of these stray animals in a preventive approach as opposed to only dealing with the stray populations in a reactive and poorly planned manner. This guide is an important step in helping reduce animal welfare problems as much as public health risks and presents effective and humane approach as illustrated in these three case studies. We now encourage member states authorities to support this guides, gu uh, guidance built on these lessons learned from uh, um, learned and implement these principles in their own population management policies as well as probably to assist third countries, our neighbors, I mean, to follow uh, these policies because we have so many tools, how we can cooperate on a broader scale. 
and let me to thank all these speakers and presenters and uh, uh, you present in, in this room during the discussion thank you so much thank you for your replies and uh, we're looking forward for our commitment uh, in this regard and we will do it because uh, there is no other way how to uh, fully implement animal welfare policies in Europe and Europe around. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy your day. And thank you, Secretary. Indeed, thank you all who, uh, who have made uh, possible our exchange in such an effective way. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you. Well done. <laughs>